You're now listening to the Tax Smart REI Podcast, the number one tax podcast for real estate investors. After helping over a thousand investors in our previous boot camps, we're excited to announce our next QBO boot camp, which is coming up in January 2024. By the end of this boot camp, you'll have a streamlined bookkeeping system built for your long-term or short-term rental business. This is critically important because it allows you to improve cash flow, ensures you're not missing out on critical tax deductions, and makes tax filing a breeze. The QBO bookkeeping boot camp is led by our very own accounting expert Taylor Brugnet and consists of easy to learn video lessons as well as two live Q and A's and a private forum where you can get answers to your questions. With tax season just around the corner, if you don't already have a bookkeeping system in place, there's no better time than now. If you're interested in joining this January QBO bookkeeping bootcamp, visit www.taxsmartinvestors.com slash bookkeeping to join the waitlist today. Again, that's www.taxsmartinvestors.com slash bookkeeping to join the waitlist today. We'll see you there, but for now, we'll dive right into today's episode. Troy, thanks for taking the time to come on the show today. For our listeners who might not be familiar, would you be able to give them a little bit of an overview of your background and how you got involved with the oil and gas space? Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. I started out in 1985. I was in college studying economics and finance, and I had an opportunity to go to work for a small boutique energy brokerage firm that worked with high net worth investors and high income earners that wanted tax deductions in 1985. And the way they got that is by drilling domestic oil and gas wells. And so I started out at 20 years old as an investment broker. And then over the next few years, I ended up with my own investment company and I started my own oil company. Here I am 30, almost 38 years later with 100% of my focus in oil and gas uh, going on almost four decades of expertise. So started off with just an idea, started off with a job and turned into an entire career. That's amazing. And it's a long track record to be in the business. You know, we have a lot of interest in this space from our listeners, and a lot of people are looking at oil and gas as a great opportunity to reduce taxes. So we'll definitely get to that. But if someone's looking at the oil and gas space, looking at an oil and gas investment, why would they want to invest in oil and gas? So I'm going to give you two answers, and you'll see kind of why I'm providing you both. First off, if I took a thousand millionaires that were considered accredited investors and put them in a room, and you candidly describe how it worked, the risk, the profit, the benefits, you'd be lucky if 10 out of 1,000 stayed in the room and said, yeah, I hear all that and I still want to be an investor because it's a very difficult industry for the average investor. It's not like I can Google or get online and find the answers that I want. It's, it's kind of the old shell game, right? So for one hand, there is a lot of interest in oil and gas and a lot of interest in it being an, a direct owner investor in it but it's very risque. It's very kind of not easy to find details. And so people walk right up to the edge and then they back away and they go do something else, right? So why somebody wants to be in oil and gas is because you don't have a balanced portfolio if you don't. So everything negatively correlated to rising oil and gas prices, you know, real estate, cost of capital, inflation rate, everything that's going negative right now is causing oil to be a much better asset. They work bipolar to each other, right? So whether I'm in stocks, public equities, or direct ownership in oil and gas, if I don't have some type of energy in my portfolio, that seesaw balance in my portfolio is out of whack. So the one reason why President Trump you know, didn't try to help the oil and gas industry four years ago, he wanted cheap oil. It made the economy boom, right? Under the current administration, oil prices took off, gas prices took off, what's the economy doing? Sinking. So if you're going to be a long-term player in real estate, equity, stock, you have to look at the, the 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 reverse correlation between energy prices and the economy, right? And that's one reason why you want to be in it. The flip side of that is you don't want to be in it if you're going to just throw your money away by investing in crooks, liars, cheats, and thieves, which is about 95% of those sponsors who offer oil and gas. They make nobody money but themselves. And I've been doing this for four decades, and I can tell you I could peel a deal apart in three seconds. It's always one thing. It's loaded with fees, has no financial intent. But they hang the big bell on the on the door. It says tax write offs, and they come like a bunch of rats to cheese. So that's kind of what happens with oil and gas. That's interesting. So oil and gas definitely helps you. Like it, basically, what it sounds like, it helps you offset your portfolio, or balance out your portfolio. So in the good times, when things are going great, like that's all well and good. But when the bad times hit, oil and gas helps balance that out and makes make sure your portfolio is not uh, not necessarily, I guess, uh, underwater, if you will, or not too much underwater. Well, look, look at 2022 when Russia started the war, oil prices jumped to $129 a barrel. What happened to all the earnings of all the public companies? What happened to diesel and transportation and shipping costs and plastics? And so what happened is everything in my office is made from a barrel oil. Everything on your desk is made from plastic, synthetics, refined products. So when oil prices skyrocketed last year, it went through the entire economy 
and help cause the inflation, help cause the deterioration of the economy. But my, a lot of my clients, we've got about 1,600 high net worth investors. They're like, doesn't bother me because I'm getting paid $129 a barrel. So it offset my stock portfolio. It offset my real estate. So for those who want to listen, it is incredibly smart to put energy in your portfolio. But if you put it in stocks, the problem is you're riding that stock market wave, that public equity. So if stocks get pulled down, you get drugged down. So what most of our partners have decided is, look, we're high net worth investors, high income. Let's get direct ownership in oil and gas. So the, the benefits financially come directly to us. We're not in that public market. And when we start to take a correction in the stock market or correction in real estate, this other asset class called direct ownership and energy starts to perform really, really well. And it balances my portfolio. That's what our sophisticated clients have been doing for the last five years. That's very interesting. And this, I feel like, is is newer for me. But tell us about these clients who are interested in this, obviously not probably just from tax savings, and we'll get to that. But what is some of the returns that people are looking at as compared to, obviously, you're talking about kind of this balance. Uh, stocks go down, okay, we go up uh, in the energy sector. But what is some of the returns that people might expect? And I know you probably can't give too specific, but just tell us a little bit about returns there. I, I, I can give you as specific as you want. Okay. I'm, I'm like 99% <laughs> of people who offer oil and gas, we tell you down to the penny what we're making, what we're losing, because transparency is the key to, to trust, right? Get Show everybody what you have. Either you're good or you're bad. And it's like a batting average, right? Show it. Um, let's start off with the simplicity, okay? A well that's drilled that's successful and a well that's dry hole offers the same tax benefits. The IRS says if you invest in 2023 in oil and gas, about 80% of your investment is going to be deducted this year. It's things like labor and cost and drilling. They're not tangible. They don't stick around. So you get to expense them this year. 20% is going to be carried over its pipe, its tanks, its equipment, its tangible assets. Those are amortized or depreciated. So the idea is I get the same tax benefits, whether it's a good well or a bad well. So let's focus on making money and not the taxes. That's the first thing. 95% or more focus on the tax benefit and they forget about making money. The second thing you have to remember is that from my standpoint, when I participate in the wells Ecker does, we're participating with major billion dollar oil companies. We drill with the majors. Marathon, Oxy. So why is that? Major oil companies get no tax write-off. So if they spend $10 million on a well and I buy 10% of it for a million dollars, they got to make back 10 million. I only have to make back 63% because I get 37% paid by the IRS. So my economics are much better than the major oil company drilling. So there's not a chance that Marathon or Oxy or Exxon or anybody else is drilling that well with the intention of losing money. But I have a 37% advantage of breaking even because they have to get 100% back. Most of these small sponsors don't drill with majors. They drill with their own projects they generate and they don't care if it breaks even because they're charging so much in fees and commissions and hidden cost, right? So the way my company aligned myself, I said, if it's good enough for Exxon or Marathon or Oxy or a major billion dollar company and they got to get 100% back, my threshold is 63% if I take my tax consideration. But that's not how we invest. Because if I only wanted to get 63% back, hell, I just pay my taxes, put 630000 in the bank and generate 5% interest. That's not the game. But it is the necessary elements of the reasons why you want to invest in domestic exploration if you can do it with big companies that have the right plan. So the financial returns, as your question was, Ryan, is simple. I would like to be in a drilling venture that gets my tax write-offs, but I want to make my money back in less than 36 months. My threshold for Troy is 36 months or less. So my engineers, my geologists, we run the numbers, we backfill that and say, based on commodity prices, decline curves, et cetera, does that project, based on the cost, get me to an extremely high probability of making all my money back inside of 36 months? Some of our wells pay out in six months, some pay out in 24 months. But overall, out of all the wells we drilled the last five years, we're averaging about 60 to 65% cash on cash the first year, the first 12 distributions. And we're looking at target payout average of about 26 months or less. So we're way ahead of the curve. Why is that? We buy right. We have a really, really tight restriction buy box. And so if it's not good enough for my money, it's not good enough for my partner's money. And I normally buy and keep 25% to 50% of every well we offer. I keep it for my company. So it's got to be good enough for me. I'm not going to give it to my clients. That's kind of the threshold of, of returns we're looking for. That's pretty good investment returns, which is important, right? Because I know a lot of people, and Ryan and I will probably talk about this a little later, a lot of people get so caught up in the tax benefits of this investment or in this asset class that they often forget to uh, make money. I mean, look, I, I was on a CPE, a certified uh, professional education platform, not too long ago. 
where the person putting on the presentation, and I kid you not, and I'm not going to say any names, was saying, don't invest in this if you want an investment. In fact, we don't even offer this investment unless someone's CPA is on board because it's so tax driven. Uh, so it's kind of refreshing to see that there is actually an investment aspect to this asset class and not just some tax benefits. But kind of moving on along down the line here, we, we all love a good investment. We all love good returns. What are the, some of the risks of investing in this asset class? So if you're looking at the risk, in my view, the order starting at the top riskiest down to the bottom in drilling oil and gas wells to get tax write-offs, the number one risk is the who. Who are you investing with? Now, it's tricky because you might have Johnny Oil and Gas call you and say, hey, I'm raising a million dollars to get in the wells. And you think, well, Johnny Oil and Gas, I need to look at his background, his track record. Well, that's true. You do because Johnny could be a crook, a liar. He could have bought that interest for 250 grand. You don't know it. He marked it up to a million. When you write the check for 100 grand, 75,000 is going in his pocket, 25,000 is going in the actual well, and he's got to pay the other oil companies really drilling it. So here's the point of that story. If I've got to give him 100,000 and 25,000 is going in the well, that well's got to make four to one for me to get my money back. Most oil companies drill based on a three to one, right? So you're not going to make money to start with. You've lost the minute you wrote the check. The other thing is, is because this is an asset class, you can't just look online and find out what a well cost and what the promote is. It's it's a game you've never played before. You have no idea how they're going to skin you. So you better find out the who. And then the next thing is you got to find out the incentive, like what's in it for you. And I don't want to do anything that the person offering the investment doesn't believe in their own investment where they're going to put their own money into it. So, I mean, I don't care if you put in 20% or 5%. But tell me who you are, and I need to see your background. If you were a multifamily flipper 24 months ago and your whole portfolio sucks and you're telling your clients you're going to cash home, now all of a sudden you're an energy expert? What the heck? Okay, I was a proctologist yesterday. Now I'm a neurologist. You got the ends mixed up. I don't know where you're going, right? In this case, I'm looking at all these new promoters coming out. Two years ago, they were selling cars or multifamily or self-storage. And what happens is the investors hear the dinner bell. The dinner bell is immediate tax deductions off your gross income, 80 to 100%, just invest, don't worry, we'll make the money back. Even if we have a crummy well, we can make back 60% of our money. Here's the problem. If you truly get a tax write-off, according to the IRS standards, you have to be at risk. What I keep telling these wealthy clients is, here's the way it works. Johnny Oil and Gas raises the money, you guys buy into his working interest, you're at risk. You get the tax deduction. Johnny goes bankrupt in 24 months because he doesn't want to have to tell you you're never going to make your money back. He sold an illegal unregistered security. Here's the problem. That oil company says, you collectively bought 10% of my well. We got to rework the well. We got to plug the well. We got to do reclamation. You're on the hook. So Johnny goes away bankrupt. Now you guys have your share of those final costs. So to me, I don't want to put any money where my fingers can get any dirtier than what I originally intended. So I think it goes beyond just tax write-off. You better know who you're with. They better have a 10-year track record, and they better tell you how they're going to manage your money from start to finish, because the wells that we drill have 25 to 50-year well life. Most of my clients will be dead and gone by the time these wells are plugged, right? So it's important you know who you're in that ring with. Now, let me give you the flip side. The way oil and gas drilling should work, it truly is its own investment class. Let me explain. I put in a million dollars this year, and I buy in 15 wells. I'm hoping those wells will pay out in 24 to 36 months. Next year, I have more income. I put another million in. But I should get back 35 to 45% of this first million. Next year, I got a million five to invest. The million of my income and 500 grand I made off my wells. By the time I get four or five years out, I'm investing two or $3 million a year. And I've created my own self-generating tax write-off. And I've generated my own self-propelling asset class. Because each lease that I buy, the way Ecker does it is, I get the right to develop the new wells that are coming which means I'm creating a bigger, bigger inventory of wells. I get tax deductible items. I can participate if I want to. I can bypass them when I don't want to. And at the end of the day, instead of treating oil and gas drilling like a poker game where you're putting an ante down or a bet, it truly is its own sector of oil and gas investing. I've been doing it for 37 years. I've got wells been on like 20, 30 years, and it just keeps compounding every single year. That is what oil and gas can do for you if you stop listening to the dinner bell of it's a tax write-up. Here's a simple thing. When you tell me it's a tax deduction, the IRS only gives you a tax deduction if you lose money, right? I don't consider it a tax deduction. It's a tax deferment. I want to take money this year. I owe the IRS $370,000 on a million bucks. I want the IRS to let me keep it and invest in a goodwill. 
And then next year, I want to take the income plus the next million dollars, and I want to defer that next year. The idea is I want to always defer my taxes so I can use the IRS's money for 37% higher purchasing power to prolong the growth of my net worth and delay the taxes that I owe. When you ever do, when you tell me tax deduction, take my million dollars and set it on fire in the parking lot because the deduction means you're going to lose my money. I'm not into deductions. I'm into deferment. I think a lot of our clients are going to resonate with that because it sounds like cost segregation studies on real exactly. estate. Same thing. Same so, thing. Yep. Same I think thing. a lot of people are going to resonate with that idea. Um, you're not an attorney and neither are we, but as far as the risks go, my yeah. understanding is essentially, hey, you've got to buy this in your own personal name. There can't be any LLCs. Do you have any other comments as far as things that you've seen as far as reducing risk other than, like you just said, like who are you buying with and, and things like that from that kind of aspect? Well, Ryan, let me, let me correct you on that. <laughs> I invest in an LLC, but it's a single member LLC. So I take my interest in my own personal LLC and then I buy in the wells. Here's the other thing that's a reality. I've been drilling wells since 1985. I was 20 years old when I bought my first wells, right? I was a kid. I've never had a single lawsuit come back to me or my investors in 37 years. I've been involved in close to 8,000 wells, I think in about 12 or 13 states so far. Shallow 1,500 feet, as deep as 20,000 feet. Wells that cost 500,000 up to wells that cost 20 plus million dollars. Why does that work that way? Well, when the major oil company proposes a well, they have insurance. They say, Here's the insurance for the general account for the well. Do you want to participate? Well, hell yes, I do. I want Exxon's, you know, half billion dollar policy. The other thing is every operator has every vendor with all this umbrella and insurance. I've had guys killed on rigs. We've had fires. We've had wells blow out. We've had them burn to the ground. Picture behind me is a well on fire. It happened in like 1997. Well caught fire twice. No liability, no recourse. Why? The likelihood you have something happen in my 37 years career is zero as a reflection of coming back to me. But if it did... I have my drilling in Eckerd Global LLC, and that keeps me from any of my other assets being exposed, right? And when I get a certain number of wells, I set up the second LLC to isolate them in pockets. It's no different than investing in real estate or any other special purpose vehicle. It's tax planning. Now, the reality is you need to be at risk. What does that really mean? Well, you got to be able to own it directly. You got to be able to pay your bills. And that means there's not a, well, is this 100,000? Am I limited to 100,000? It's an open checkbook. The flip side, if you do it the way we do it, is the wells come under budget, we send refunds back. Everybody else turnkeys, which means we're going to charge you for a $10 million well, the equivalent of $30 million. We're going to pocket 66%. When the well goes over, you got to trust, I didn't go spend it on crack, cocaine, and alcohol, and I'm going to pay that bill, or I'm going to say, sorry, I've spent the money, and the turnkey doesn't work, and the money's gone. I'm being a little facetious, but that's really how it works, and I hear it time and time again where these investors are so worried about risk, they pay three times the cost to be in this turnkey fixed price. That's BS. Just drill the well. You think Exxon or Marathon or somebody else is going to drill it for any more cost? Whatever they pay, I pay. I don't care. If I take 5% of a well that's a million dollars over, that's $50,000. So what is it? $1,000 per partner? Who cares? It, there's what I call fiction. And then there's what I call practical assessment. It's probability factor, right? I've been doing this since, since gosh, back when I had hair and I had no wrinkles on my face, you know? Definitely, you know, when it comes to investing in private investments, for sure, it's about who you're investing with. It's probably the number one thing. And doing your due diligence, of course, and and making sure you're, you're, you're getting in the right boat is like one of the number one things, right? Second thing is, Thomas, is motive. Find out the guy. Even if you think he's a good guy, what's your motive? Why are you offering this? What do you get out of it? I just tell my clients, this is what I get. If you think I'm too expensive, you can go down the street. It's motive. I want to know who you are, and I want to know why you're doing it. You're not working your butt off to represent a bunch of clients because you're making $1.50 an hour. I don't mind you making money. I want you to be in business. Tell me who you are and why you're doing it. Then we can talk about what you're doing. That's an excellent point too, because to your point, there's a lot of people out there who promote these things who are in one thing one day and in another thing the next day. So their motive is just to make a buck. Whatever is going to make them that buck that day is what they're doing. So right. uh, very big point there. With all this being said, who should consider such an investment? Like who, if I'm sitting out there right now listening to this, how do I know if this investment is right for me? How do I know when it's time to take this step? Who typically invests in these types of things? For me, I'm just going to use my own experience. I've had clients who are a million to $3 million net worth and they make 200000 a year, right? They're probably not the right candidate. You put in $50,000, well, that's 25% of your income. Yeah, I've got some assets. The reality of it is I'm not trying to put a house together by buying a brick. 
I want to buy a pile of bricks so I can build a house and a foundation for my portfolio. So what I always tell partners is, look, if you made an extra bonus this year and you're trying to throw twenty five or fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollars in a drilling deal, it's kind of like a drive by gambler in Vegas. You're running by putting hundred grand down, crossing your fingers, either win or you lose. I don't look for that kind of partner. I want doctors and lawyers and bankers and dentists, and I want engineers and I want manufacturers and I want financial professionals who are going to make 300000 or more a year. It's a career, and they always are going to have income because why? I want to go drill some wells, and when the additional wells are continued to be drilled to harvest the oil and gas in place, I need to know that the people I've invited to the party can afford to participate in those additional wells, or you kind of miss the point, right? And so from that standpoint, my definition of a qualified investor into oil and gas drilling, you got to have at least a million dollar net worth by SEC standards. Technically, I like somebody over two and a half million. I want somebody who's going to invest whatever dollar is this year, but I'm going to say, can you afford to invest the same amount for the next two or three years? So if you want to put a hundred thousand in, can you do a hundred thousand next two or three years? Are you willing to do it? Yes, I am. Great. Now, I don't say you have to. I mean, we drill a bunch of dry holes. You're not going to want to drill the offsets to it, right? But if they're good wells and you have a bumper crop and success, don't lose the advantage of de-risking the first well by not drilling the offset well. So it is about liquidity, income, net worth, and then it's, of course, about sophistication. If you get Johnny nervous on the phone, he's like, ah, if I drill the well, what's the chance it's a dry hole? And if it's dry, I always tell him, I just made one of my doctors mad yet. I said, you're not qualified for this. He goes, what do you mean? I make a million dollars a year. I said, you're too emotionally distraught. This is not for you. There's a reason why the high, high stakes tables in Vegas are empty. Nobody can afford to lose $500 a hand. You see very few people there. Oil and gas is more for sophisticated investors than just the average Joe. Just because you make 200 grand a year doesn't mean you make a lot of money. Sorry, not in, this, not in this game. I will add this. One thing I do like about it too is the income derived off of the income from the wells. When they kick in line and start producing, I only pay taxes on 85%. So the IRS says, look, you're depleting a reservoir like depreciating a building. If I make a million dollars in income off oil and gas wells, I'm only paying taxes on 850000 I like the compound effect. I like the fact I'm getting monthly revenue so I can reinvest it monthly, which gives me a higher internal rate of return, better utilization of my capital. I can do better tax planning. So if I can drill wells, most promoters try to sell all their working interest in the last four months of the year because everybody's figuring out what their income is and how much they're trying to shelter. Some of the best wells you'll ever drill are offered in January, February, March. Why? There's not a big hype. There's not a big incentive. Not everybody's scrambling to the finish line. And so for me, if I can invest in January, February, I get to use that tax deduction to lower my quarterly taxes, my, my annual tax, my, all my taxes. I can start managing that ahead of time, whereas I can't do that if I don't have tax deductible investments. So there is some tax advantages about timing, using that tax-free income, and just you're either in the game or you're not in the game. So I would just stress that if any investor is looking at it, when you talk to myself or, or one of our wealth managers, it's about how do we help you maximize participating and also recognizing the best deployment or the best plan, how to get maximum tax deduction slash uh, deferment as you possibly can. Got it. That makes a ton of sense. And I, I definitely could see why that could be the case for sure. So just kind of recap the tax benefits, because I, I know there's a lot of listeners out there who are just probably listening to this right now and just like, this is amazing. I just need a recap of the tax benefits. So you get the 80%, you get the, like right now in 2023, we get the bonus depreciation in that first year. A lot of that stuff, it gets to get written off just like real estate. But then going forward, you also have the wells that are getting depleted and you're getting a write-off for that as well. So that kind of shelters the cash flow, if you will, from the wells. 15% of your income is tax-free because of that depletion. So let's just use a number. I write a check for $100,000 at five o'clock, December the 31st. 80% of that's tax deductible on the well, typically, right? So I just saved $80,000 of gross income I don't have to report in whatever my tax bracket is. The remaining 20,000 is subject to being depreciated in 2024, 2025 because it's equipment, it's depreciation. What I'm hoping is the well starts drilling in the first quarter. I start getting revenue by the end of summer of 2024. I've got income next year. Now I got income coming back to let me reinvest again next year, but I also have depreciation. So what it pay technically is, it just think for every hundred thousand I write a check for, it's about eighty percent tax deductible the year I write the check. The twenty percent continues over the next two to four years, but most of my clients are finding out they're getting paid out so fast they don't get the full benefit of that depreciation because they've already made their money back. There's not any additional losses to be taken. You always get the fifteen percent tax free even after your investments paid back. You always get to take 
15% off your uh, taxable income as a result of that depletion allowance. So it really is a great strategy, but I'm going to tell you right now, my clients send me package after package after package. I'll go through and I go, they marked it up three times the money. This deal has no economic sense. You're doing the small army. I will tell your listeners this, do not drill vertical wells, zero. There is no reason to drill vertical wells that have a 60 to 80% chance of dry hole when the major companies like Exxon just paid $60 billion for Pioneer. Why is that? Because it's about a 99% success rate drilling horizontal wells. And so I want to drill with the majors drill and I want to be a little fly on their back. When that bull elephant goes to the watering hole, I want to be sitting right on their back. I don't mind taking one or 2% and participating with major oil companies because I want to make money. I'll get the taxes, but I want to make money. So just do not do vertical wells at all. I did it for 30 something years, nightmare of dry holes and failed losses. Never do it again. That's a good tip out there. I'm sure a lot of people probably would make that mistake if you not called that out. So really appreciate that. So oil and gas, uh, this has given a tremendous amount of clarity to me and I'm sure Ryan as well. I know there's another investment asset class that you're involved in and that's mineral rights. And I actually did some work with a client a few years back who had, uh, we, we kind of went through some issues with mineral rights. They had stumbled upon something that yeah. they, didn't, they didn't realize they had. So kind of going along the same lines, like what are mineral rights and uh, why, why would someone invest in mineral rights? All right. So let's think about the food chain. Every industry has a food chain. In real estate, somebody has 50 acres of land. It's farmland. Another buyer comes in and says, I can convert that farmland through entitlements, annexation, et cetera. I can turn that into a commercial property by rezoning it, reclassifying. So it goes from 2,000 an acre to 10,000 an acre. Once I do the entitlements and get the roads, the pavement, et cetera, now it's worth $10 a square foot, right? Oil and gas has the same kind of food chain. So it's Exxon, Chevron, Oxy. Every company, regardless of size in the United States that wants to drill a well on private land has to go to the landowner who owns three rights. I own the air rights. I own the surface rights, which is anything attached to the surface. And I own all the rights to the natural resources below the surface, which are called mineral rights. So back in the land grant days, when I got my one square mile and put my flag in the ground off my horse and said, this is my square mile, my 640 acres, I got those three rights. But I didn't know anything about drilling. I didn't know we we're going to be using air rights. Didn't know all that. As time has evolved, what's been available for these landowners is to start monetizing those assets. And the reason why it was important is old granddad Eckerd had a thousand acres in Oklahoma, gave it to his four kids. They're trying to raise sheep and cattle, et cetera. All of a sudden, oil and gas is being discovered. And I go, man, I can't even pay my bill. I can't pay for the tractor, the feed. Hey, you know what? Knock, knock, knock. Oil company says, I want to lease your minerals. They go out and lease the minerals to drill a well. Well, great. They pay me $100 an acre. Well, there's a speculator that comes out and says, let me buy your minerals instead of leasing it. Well, how does that work? Well, I'll give you $1,000 an acre if you sell me 40 of your 640 acres. And now I own minerals in the same section of land you own. So what happened is it became a monetization of landowners being able to sell off air rights or lease them, keep their surface rights, their ranch, their building. There's literally oil and gas underneath my feet right here in Dallas. The Barnett Shale, it's like the second largest gas reservoir in the United States, sitting right here below Dallas, Fort Worth, discovered back in 1997. So whoever owns this building, owns this building I'm in. Somebody else owns the mineral rights, most likely than the building owner itself, and somebody else owns the air rights. So mineral rights are all the natural resources below the ground. It's a piece of real estate. The IRS treats it like real estate. It's available for 1031 exchange, and you can invest in your self-directed IRA. And it can be completely severed and deeded as a separate deed and title. You can go to the courthouse and see somebody owns the, the minerals, somebody owns the surface, and somebody owns the, the air. Three different deeds, three different titles, three different owners, same property. We want to buy and we do buy mineral rights because what we want to get is free cash flow without any liability. And I want billion dollar oil companies drilling and developing the wells on those minerals that I own for free. I want zero risk. I just want free income called a royalty distribution every 30 days. That's a mineral right. Wow. So I, I can foresee a lot of overlap with obviously oil and gas and these mineral rights. So as we think about like, who's the right person then to invest in something more like that? And then as we talked about earlier, as far as like, hey, what's the return on that kind of investment? How is it different from oil and gas? And then maybe just also hitting on risks. Uh, I know it's kind of multiple questions in there, but just trying to compare it to the oil and gas conversation that we just had. Okay, so keep in mind, mineral rights owners are oil and gas. So when I go out and look at a 640-acre tract of land and I knock on Farmer Smith's land, 
he leases me the right to drill a well on his property, but he owns 100% of every geological formation and all the oil and gas and natural resources from the surface to the core of the earth, right? But he can't drill a well. He doesn't know where to drill, how to drill, doesn't have the money. So that oil company can lease it. So the first thing is that mineral oil can get a lease payment, which is great. It's like getting three years worth of income in one check up front, unlike real estate that's paid monthly, right? The second part is that because I, as the mineral owner, don't have the money to drill the well, I want to lease it and I want to get a contract that says, Exxon, thank you for leasing my land. Now let's negotiate what percentage of profit I get. And that's generally between 12 and a half to 25% of all future gross revenue gets paid back to the mineral owner. So if you weren't sophisticated in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, you're just praying to God somebody would drill a well. Well, maybe you got a 12 and a half percent royalty and you got $25 an acre for lease. Today, some of that acreage is being leased for 15 to 20,000 an acre. And some of those minerals are trading for 75 to $150,000 an acre. The surface is worth 2,000. The mineral rights are worth $100,000 an acre. Because why? Because the evolution of technology made horizontal drilling and fracking so low risk and so robust in oil and gas in place that these mineral owners now realize, wait a minute, <laughs> forget daddy's ranch and the 600 acres and cows. I'm sitting on, you know, $40 million in future revenue from the oil and gas under the ground. So traders got involved, speculators, just like real estate got involved in 2010 when the whole horizontal expiration fad took off. And they'd go out and talk to this unsophisticated landowner, say, hey, dummy, let me buy your minerals for $1,000 an acre. Also, they sudden, they drill a horizontal well, and he makes five or $10,000 back on the $1,000 per acre. But that guy only thought there was going to be one well. Fast forward 10 years, same technology that drives Tesla's cars, same technology that takes spacecraft to Mars. They're using to guide these drill bits with triangulation using satellites to go down two miles vertically, two miles horizontally, and they're guiding that drill bit within two to three inches going out almost four miles, two down and two out. And now they're accessing reservoirs that are typically, they look like wet concrete, could not flow, could not make them produce. And because of the technology and the way they drill it and the way they frack it, they're now making wells that can make, I don't know, a million barrels of oil per well with a 98 to 99% success rate. Now I can go buy that mineral today. I probably will pay 10 to 15,000 an acre, but I think it's going to generate 40 to $80,000 in future revenue. The cool thing about being a mineral owner is once they lease it for me, the oil company, okay, I take zero future capital exposure. They can't bill me. They can't charge me. There's no fees. They have the legal obligation at the end of the month when they sell the oil, sell the gas to the buyers. When they get that accounting back in, the first thing that oil company says is, we don't own that top 12 and a half to 25%. It's not our money. We fiduciarily have to give it to the mineral owners. So we set it in a separate account and then we pay out all the mineral owners first. We're top of the food chain. No cost, no liability, no holding cost. I've had minerals for 30 years. I get a check every month on wells that have been around for 30 years. I don't even know who the heck operates it anymore. I get a check and it's going to last. These are horizontal wells will last 25 to 100 years. There's no passive income asset like it in the world. What's happened, though, is because of the internet and scraping of data, all these service providers went into all the courthouses, scraped the data, put it online. Now I have a team back here looking at every well in the United States, every base in the United States, and we're able to run algorithms and calculations knowing who the best drillers are, who recovers the most oil and gas, what the prices are, how long they drill and what it costs. Now we have this full diagnostic system that says, in the entire U.S., where's the best place to buy minerals, who's the best oil company, who drills the best, recovers the most, what's the most efficient? That's what we've been doing for the last six years. It's very fun, guys. You guys would go nuts looking at this data because it's like looking into the, the box you never could see before. Exxon wouldn't tell you to squat. Now you go, you don't have to. I got all your data online. Thank you. It, um, is, it is a blast. That is very interesting. And I'm not surprised to hear that it's gotten that sophisticated or, you know, with, with the analytics. So I'm trying to wrap my head around this right now. So mineral rights, you basically, you buy... Uh, say I was an investor, right? I'm going to come in and I'm going to make an investment in mineral rights. Am I buying the land or am I buying the rights to the land? You're buying real estate. So let's just say out of 640 acres, I own a 10 acre piece of land with a mobile home on it. I want to sell it. I go, look, I, I don't know anything about minerals. I want to sell my minerals so I can pay off my mobile home. You come along and say, well, Troy, I'll give you 10,000. Here's $100,000 for the 10 acres of minerals you own. Okay, thank you. We do a transaction purchase sale agreement. We We trade title. I have it titled in the courthouse, Thomas, in your name. Now you're the legal owner. You then take that deed and you go, who's operating the wells? Oh, it's Oventive. I'll send Oventive my copy of my deed saying, I now own that 10 acres. The effective date is December the 1st, 2023. Here's my stamp recorded deed. 
you send it to Oventive, Oventive says that's the new owner. Owner, there's three wells that were vertically drilled in the 1950s. There's two new horizontal wells. Whatever oil and gas is on this middle section, Thomas starts getting a check effective date of December the 1st, 2023. And that's the last thing you got to do because at that point in time, it's either an ACH deposit or you're endorsing the back of a check for the next 25 to 75 years. Yes. Now, the risk was, Thomas, that Ryan asked is the hard part. The hard part is we went from vertical wells, size of a paper plate, looking for a 50, 100 acre reservoir to now these, these oil and gas basins, what they call basins, they're buried Grand Canyons. There's like 40 million acres in Oklahoma and the Anadarko Basin. There's like 60 million acres in the Permian Basin in West Texas. So it's not that we can't find minerals. It's can you find a mineral that's going to make money? Because the number one thing to buy minerals, if somebody doesn't drill a well, you can be sitting on Saudi Arabian oil. If it doesn't get to the surface, I don't get paid. So there is a strategy of buying the right mineral that will get drilled and developed at the right price with the right oil company. So there's a lot of people peddling minerals. This is how easy mineral buying is. You don't have to be accredited. You don't have to be a millionaire. You can go to a truck stop in Oklahoma and on the way to the bathroom, has little stickies under it, has minerals for sale, $100 an acre in the Anadarko Basin. You go pull it off and buy it and go, yeah, I just bought five acres of minerals. You're about 40 miles away from any pipelines or drilling, and you'll never see the well drilled in your lifetime or your great grandkids' lifetime, but you own an acre in the Anadarko Basin. But really what happens is the promoter buys it for 100 an acre, and they tell you you're in the Anadarko Basin, and you spend $20,000, and you go, I own minerals, and they suck. They don't make me any money because you bought so – it'd be like buying – Property outside Detroit, 170 miles, saying you own Detroit real estate. No, you don't. You're not even barely in the same state. So the promoters use the ignorance of investors to tell them buying minerals is low risk, no cash call, no no capital calls, zero holding costs, and you're in the Anadarko Basin. You're in the Permian Basin. You're not even where you can't even sniff gas. You're so far away. So it is about buying like real estate because it is real estate. It's buying the right mineral in the right location with the right general contractor, which means the right operator. Do I want to have Exxon or Chevron or do I want to have Oxy or Continental or EOG or Diamondback? And we have a full grading system here at our company that regulates minerals, locations, area of interest, operator, performance, completions, timing. It's a very analytical business, but to the average investor is, yeah, I'll buy minerals. I'll, I'll give you hundred grand to buy 10 acres. It looks like Exxon's about nine miles away. Yeah, but there's no pipelines. So they're not going to drill there. Why aren't they going to drill there? Well, they're not going to drill a $10 million well and have to put in $100 million in pipeline. They're going to stay where their pipelines are already located. We have spent $650 million in mineral acquisitions in the last 40 months. We own 62,000 net acres of minerals. And at this point in time, we're probably the largest single private owner of minerals in the state of Oklahoma. We've all done that with private investors in the last 40 months. This year, we're going to send out almost $65 million in distributions. And with that $65 million, zero cost, zero management fee, zero expenses. Next year, we're probably going to send out between $100 and $120 million on the minerals that we own. Most of my clients ask the same question, what the risk is, Ryan and Thomas. They go, all right, Troy, this sounds too good to be true. What, what am I missing? I go, well, I'm Leo DiCaprio, right? And I'm in Catch Me If You Can movie. And I'm not really Troy. I, I'm just bullshitting. I, there's nothing about me, right? Or what you can say is Troy's incompetent. He couldn't find oil in the Jiffy Lube. Well, that's why I've been around since 1985. That's why I have the highest level of transparency of any alternative asset class out there. We created our own app. You can literally pull up your phone, look into it. And you can see every mineral, every acre, every deed, everything you own on an app sitting in an airport in France if you want to tomorrow. I spent $2 million plus to build, build that app. Why? So many crooks and liars out there in alternative investments. I wanted to set the bar so high, nobody can compete on education and transparency, specifically in oil and gas, because it's such a hard asset to get data on. It's impossible to get data on it. That's why I did what I did. Yeah, that's a lot. And again, you go back to what you said before, who? Like, who are you investing with? And you're investing with the right person. That is the key because there are a lot of people out there who, who do rack up their investments with fees just to make the money in the short term. And you know they're in and out of the business. So you have to really know who you're investing with. And this has been very enlightening in terms of understanding in this space. So from my understanding, from a tax perspective, say I'm a real estate investor, I own some yep. real estate, it's time for me to get out, right? It's time for me yep. to leave this plot. I could, from my understanding, I could 1031 exchange into mineral rights. That is correct. We just had a partner call about five weeks ago. They sold a property that had a $6 million gain. They did a 1031 into our last project about five weeks ago. They put 6.7 million in that portfolio. They start off with a thousand producing wells in that portfolio. So his check actually, I think arrives yesterday or today because the 1031 had to get the final exhibit, right? He will get his first check 
in February for a thousand producing wells. And that asset is, is targeted to make a 13 to 20% cash on cash rate of return, even at today's oil prices. So that 1031 was, I got it. What am I looking for? Boom. He takes the exhibit list of all the minerals. It came with 1,090 producing wells from day one. Should have another two to 3,000 wells drilled. He goes, I just saved the taxes. I did a 1031. I have income in 90 days, 120 days, and I'm going to make 12 to 20% cash on cash for the next, I don't know, 25 to 30 years. Everybody Man. goes, that's, that's too good to be true. It's not too good to be true. What's too good to be true is if you aggregate private investors, we collectively have more financial clout than Wall Street. The problem is you got to find somebody who's not a crook that's going to show you the way. That's the key. It sounds to me like that could be a good fit for someone who maybe is getting tired of being a landlord. They're like, hey, I'm done, right? I want to just basically go buy this more passive investments. And on our show, we've talked about Delaware Statutory Trust and doing 1031 exchanges there. But similar to the mineral rights, right? They're not the ones actively managing this, correct? Like it's you guys kind of taking care of it or some sort of operator or something like that, right? It's very passive to them. I don't even like Delaware Statutory Trust. Think about it this way. Every time there's an agreement or a contract, what are you, what are you doing? You're adding a layer of losing control. So when you buy with us, it's a purchase sale agreement. You're buying a fraction. So if I buy a thousand acres and it's a $10 million portfolio and you put in a million dollars, well, you own 10% of every mineral. You don't pick the winning mineral. It's not like a lottery. You get a fractional share of every mineral in that portfolio, which means you're diversified. You share it with what I own, right? And you're able to see multiple wells, multiple activation, but it's yours. It is a piece of paper that says, I have deed entitled to a fractional share of those thousand acres. Those deeds are filed on your record. It's on your app. It's in your file and you own direct ownership, right? So by, by looking at the way this works, you're taking something you're very familiar with, which is tangible real estate. And you go, I know I own that building. I know I own this. I would say, I don't know what the number was last year. I'm going to say probably close to 20 to $50 million in that range. That's pretty wide range. I, I want to say like 20 to $30 million we did in 1031s in 2023. And most of that's coming from people getting rid of rent houses and buildings and everything. I said, I don't want to change toilets. I'm tired of being paid rent. I dumped a building last year that I had. I had three tenants. One of the tenants called. I said, ah, the key doesn't work and the floor has got a bulb. I said, call the reset. I said, sell the building. I put in that million plus dollars in minerals. I don't want to hear about toilets. I don't want any cash flow. I don't want to see higher property taxes, zero holding costs. I don't, at my age, almost 60, want to hear about your toilet. I want to sell. 1031 back in the minerals. Now I do is have to collect a check every month. It's just, it's, just, it's become the most sought after passive investment from wealthy investors. I have investors right now. I got to tell you, in the last three years, they started investing in 20, 2019, 2020, 21, when oil dropped to negative 37, total contrarians. I've got them calling me now saying, I retired because of your checks. I'm not touching my retirement. I'm not touching my wife's retirement. I'm getting enough money every month from minerals. I'm living on your income from those wells. I'm not touching any part of my asset. They have no bills. They have no cost, no taxes. And so it's really fun for me at, at, at 40, almost 40 years of my career to see how great these investments are and how it's such an open book. Your investors are real estate professionals. This is real estate. They're used to Cost segregation and deduction. That's the working interest in drilling. So what a lot of my clients do is they'll invest in the minerals, generate that income, that 1099 income. They'll take their income from their business, match with the income off the wells. They'll drill uh, working interest with us. And they're then making money, taking deferment, making money, taking deferment. And they're just doing this. And they're having the time of their life. Now, this is really powerful. This is really powerful. Before this conversation today, I was really kind of like, I knew there's tax benefits. I understood the tax benefits, but I didn't realize it was actually a viable asset class. Uh, so really, 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 <laughs> that actually really, works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just told people just invest in it for the tax benefits, but uh, right. and I'm, I'm serious. Like <laughs> that's what I thought. But now it's been enlightening. So if our listeners want to learn more about this, or uh, you know, where can where would they be able to find more information about this, or if they wanted to jump in into an investment in this asset class, where could they do that? All right. So I'll make my answer short because I'm talkative, right? First off, all you got to do is call the office, 800-527-8895 and ask for a wealth manager. I have seven highly trained professionals that are not commissioned. They are salaried. They basically manage clients with no incentive transaction at all. That's the first thing. Or email me at teckerdeckerdenterprises.com and I'll direct you to the wealth department. But I got to tell you, the, the way I look at this is most partners will listen to this podcast. Most of your listeners will listen. And nine out of 10 who should be putting energy will listen and go, he talks fast. It's too much information. I don't get it. So I'm going to go do something else. When they call their CPAs, 
nine out of 10 CPAs have no clue how to trade oil and gas. We have to send them the, the tax code every year. Why is it? It's complex for them. They're lazy. They don't want to help you out. They're going to contact their financial advisor. Hey, I'm thinking about taking a million dollars out of your account that you make fees on to give it to oil and gas. And so, yeah, I, I, uh, you shouldn't do that. It's risky. Now watch. A lot of our clients will take money out of their other financial advisory account. They'll put it in a self-directed IRA, a 1031 exchange. Then about four months after they buy it, there's third-party appraisers that'll let them take a look at the minerals. And based on the SEC and tax code, they're getting 40 to 50% reduction in value by getting a third-party appraisal, which allows them a massive rollover to a Roth from a traditional IRA. I got really smart clients. They all figured this out. So I got engineers and financial advisors, and they all figure this out. So my point of the story is, is that if they want to get involved, it's EckerdEnterprises.com online. We have massive, massive educational information. I would encourage all of your listeners to sign up to Eckerd Insights. It's our app. Now, you can get on there without being an investor. And once you get on, you have access to all of our hundreds of hours of training and education on working interest and tax write-offs and 1031. I spend tons and tons of time educating. Why? The smarter you are, the less you're going to be screwed over by crooks. The smarter you are, the more you're going to go, that guy is the guy I'm going to invest with because that guy knows what he's doing. And that's that's what we've created. Eckerd Insights uh, is the app. Eckerd uh, Enterprises is the website. 800 numbers, how you get hold of us. And trust me, there's no pressure on my wealth, man. Our biggest problem is we don't have product. For like the last four weeks, we've had nothing to sell. Some of our stuff, $5, 10 $20 million product. We're going to do uh, right at $300 million this year in mineral acquisitions. We've gone a month without having a product because we'll put $20 million on the market. It's gone in four or five days. And we got people going, I didn't get a chance to see it. That's how much demand our product is right now. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I believe it. So we're gonna we're gonna drop that into the show notes, and me and Ryan, we're gonna be right back. We're gonna have a brief conversation about this. We're gonna debrief. Uh, super exciting, Troy. Any any final words before we we wrap up today? Yeah, I will tell you the final word is this country is consuming more oil and gas than it's ever having record. Forget the green energy; that's a bunch of BS. The U.S. and all the producers cannot keep up with supply. The key to this is if you're not in energy, you're going to be my customer. So it's your choice. Make the profit or pay Troy the profit. It's, it's your choice. So this is not about some an industry that's going away. Global demand is higher than it's ever been after seven to ten trillion dollars on alternative energy. We're using more oil and gas today than we did four years ago. It didn't work. And now we have not replaced those reserves, which means that upside oil and gas is probably 80% probability up versus 20% probability lower. I want to be in that business. I want every two-legged mammal as my customer or my partner. Your choice. That makes a lot of sense. We're going to wrap up. We'll be right back. Thanks again, Troy, for joining us today. It's, Thanks it's for having me. I appreciate it, guys. Great. Hey, real quick. If you're a longtime listener of the show, then you know we give all of our tax secrets away for free. From how to use the real estate professional status and short-term rental loophole to save thousands of dollars in taxes and just about everything in between, we don't hold anything back. And that's because our goal is to help as many real estate investors as possible reduce taxes and build tax advantage wealth, regardless of budget. And the only way we're able to help more real estate investors is if you can rate, review, and share the podcast. If you could take that one small action, just drop us a review. It'll take like 10 seconds. It will help more real estate investors become tax smart. We appreciate your support. And now back to the show. Oh, that was that was crazy, Ryan. I don't know about uh, about you, but that that was that was a tremendous episode. I learned so much about oil and gas, and you know, just listening to Troy. I, I mean, I got hyped up, and I was like, "Yo, when when am I going to be ready to make an investment like this?" But before we kind of recap everything, I want to say this to everybody out there who's listening: always do your own due diligence, uh, speak to your own uh, tax, uh, legal, and financial advisors before making any investment decisions, whether that's in oil and gas, uh, real estate, uh, the stock market, what have you. All right. You want to make sure that you're not just taking what we heard today on this episode and running with it. Okay. I just want to, to be clear. Uh, I do believe that Troy is a reputable guy and everything that he said, I do believe it, but I will say, like I said, just do your own due diligence. So I have to say, Brian, what was your initial takeaway from that? I feel like the big one was, who are you doing this investment with? I feel like that was something that he kept harping on. And I agree. And that goes for more than just investing in oil and gas, mineral rights, anything like that. It also goes for syndications, right? right. Uh, as we talked about a few episodes ago, right? There was a lot of new syndicators who came out when real estate was getting really hot. Interest rates were super low. Prices were going up. And it was like, well, now, right? All these new syndicators, it's like, who are you working with? And he had kind of the same sentiment, just in a different kind of thing that they're operating and syndicating essentially by kind of 
grabbing investors and, and pooling their money to buy these investments and right. so forth. I feel like, yeah, I learned a lot. I think I still have some questions, uh, but I think he did a great job of talking about the returns, the risks, tax benefits, and we'll break down a little bit more of that. But yeah, very excited for even just some of my clients who are thinking about this. You know, I, I generally let people know, hey, there's additional risks here in going into oil and gas. Some of it, according to Troy, is kind of, you know, just who are you working with? Uh, it's, right. it's not necessarily from what he said, which is like, oh, we're going to get sued and there's like unlimited liability. And that's normally what I've heard as far as the things that I've been reading about and hearing from other people. And it sounds like depending on who you're working with, you know, if they know what they're doing, that risk can be very much mitigated, not just who, but also he talked about insurance that goes like along with the investment that you're doing. Does the company who's putting this together have enough insurance in case someone does get hurt or there's a fire in, in something like that? So I feel like there was a lot there to unpack. But yeah, what did you think? Yeah, I, I mean, like Troy said, I, I'm a big believer in Who Not How. It's a book. Actually, there's actually a book on it called Who Not How by Dr. Ben Hardy and Dan Sullivan, um, a big fan of, of all of their work. And it's about finding who's the expert in that area and investing with the right person. And look, I'm in uh, multiple deals as a limited partner with sponsors. And uh, one of the biggest thing on my list, in fact, the biggest thing on my list is who am I investing with? Am I investing with somebody who's reputable? Because at the end of the day, they're going to be the one operating the deal. And they're going to be the one who it's going to sink or swim. So do they have the track record? Do they know what they're talking about, right? Do they have referrals? Do they have other people who could vouch for them? All big things. So who you're investing with is super important. And that, that goes for any, any investment. One of the biggest things um, that I took away though from this, and like I said in the episode, was that this is actually a viable asset class from an investment perspective. And uh, I wasn't lying. I was seriously, I was on a CPE not too long ago on an oil and gas CPE trying to learn about the tax benefits of this and trying to like, go verify my understanding of it. And the person was like, you know, if your clients aren't going to use the tax benefits, we wouldn't even in, we wouldn't even have them in our deal because like <laughs> because it, there's no investment benefit to it or the investment benefits just don't make sense. And I'm like, you know, you can't let the tax tail wag the dog. I mean, all these tax advantage investments are there for a reason. Like 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 Troy said, like there's a great way to look at tax deferral in in general, right? You're taking the tax benefits, and we talk about this all the time. You take the losses from whatever asset class you're investing in, whether it's real estate, you're using the short-term rental loophole or using reps or whatever, or it's oil and gas, mineral rights, and you're taking the losses, you're taking the tax savings and you're reinvesting it to plow it back in. And that's really what the tax code is designed to do. I'm getting a little hyped up right here, but that's why they designed the tax code and give you these benefits is because they want you to take the tax savings and reinvest and continue producing these scarce resources or these very difficult things for the government to do like housing. That's why real estate has so much tax benefits is because it's a resource that the government would rather have the private sector handle. Same thing with oil and gas and other natural resources. So that's, that was a big takeaway for me. And I'm glad to hear that we're not letting the tax tell it the way the dog. I mean, that's really what I have on it. And I can't say this enough. Just do your own due diligence on any investment you invest into. That's it. That's what I have to say. Yeah. And, you know, for those who might still be unsure about the risk, whether it's, you know, asset protection or something like that, at least Troy talked about, you know, holding these through a single member LLC for his oil and gas investments. I've heard various different things on that. So I kind of want to do some more research on that. But always check with your attorney, specifically if you're concerned about asset protection. You know, if you want or you can hold it through a single member LLC, that's always something to consider. But I really did like how he focused primarily on the investment returns and that it is a good investment compared to what we normally talk about, especially as tax advisors and strategists. Hey, here's the tax savings, right? But here's someone who's actually more focused on the investment, purely an investment standpoint compared to just the tax savings. And we'll, we'll I think over time, you know, get more information and talk about this more as the overall, you know, industry changes and as uh, investor sentiment about different industries changes and so forth. But this is a very good investment for some people, right? As you've already said, all the disclaimers. But to me, this is a, a more open asset than I would even consider for myself or other people who are like, hey, I'm done with real estate. I want to diversify. And they're like, I don't want to do stocks, right? I don't want to do bonds. I've got my emergency fund and so forth. And they're like, what else is there? 
hey, here's another alternative asset. And I know we've talked about other alternative assets on the podcast, but here's another legitimate thing that you can be exploring. It's another thing though, you know, I almost just think about it, getting to my, putting on my strategy hat as we're talking here. It's like, it's just another way people always say, well, I just did a presentation today in the insiders group and it was on the tax smart roadmap, something new that I developed. And I'll be sharing more of that here on the show in 2024. But thinking about the long term, okay, like if you're an investor, realize that I don't know, you know, whoever's listening to this right now, how old you are, but I'm looking at investing as a decades long game. And even frankly, even beyond my lifetime, almost like my kid's lifetime, it will just, it will will perpetuate. So like, if you look at it a big long term, people will say, well, what happens when I invest in real estate? I no longer want to be a landlord, right? Well, here's another exit strategy, right? Okay, right. so you 1031 exchange into the DST. That's one. You could do a 721 exchange. We talked about that here on the show before in the past. Now you have this 1031 exchange into another option. So really at the end of the day, if you zoom out, real estate and the power to build wealth through real estate is so much more than just reps. It's so much more than just the short-term rental loophole, which by the way are very powerful. And if you have the opportunity to use them, by all means, but just realize that you can build a tremendous amount of wealth tremendous amount of wealth and we have clients who've done this without without ever using reps or the short-term rental loophole just 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 remember that it just takes a long-term view for everybody to see it having said all that i think uh we're at time i know it's probably one of the longest episodes that we've ever done any parting words ryan any final words before we wrap up today maybe just touch on real quick for our listeners about the tax kind of forms that they might receive from these different investments uh, as far as like, hey, if I invest in oil, gas, what am I going to get on the tax form? Because it's going to be a little different uh, compared right. to a lot of things. Right, right, absolutely. And and we'll probably do another episode on this. I'm sure we will do another episode on oil and gas where we'll break down the tax benefits in greater detail now that we have this additional context. But from my understanding of, of it and from my understanding of oil and gas in general is you typically receive a K-1, just like you would investing into a real estate partnership and that's where you get passed through the the losses and you're typically a general partner at least for the first year that you're in some of these deals and then from the mineral rights perspective you're receiving a 1099 and i'm not a mineral rights expert okay so we again we'll probably come back and do another episode on this but sounds like that was a royalty that you're getting um that's what it sounded like and so just to be aware that when you get into the game of alternative investments, and I know a lot of listeners here are already in the game of the alternative investment world, you're running astray of the traditional, I'm getting my 1099B from the broker and I'm going to have it all nice and tight and buttoned up by January 31st and I'll be able to file my tax returns by February. Um, it's a little bit more complex. You want to be aware of that and you want to be prepared for that. All right. So thanks for listening. We'll catch you. I think we have one more episode left before the end of the year. That's going to be with James. James is going to be coming on the show. He's going to be talking about the what he sees going on in the short-term rental market, how he's playing the game, and whether or not short-term rentals is still a viable asset class. And is the short-term rental loophole still a viable tax strategy in 2024? We'll talk about all that next week. So we'll catch you there. <laughs>